Egypt, the fascination of this land and of the extraordinary civilization that blossomed here thousands of years ago, inspires the imagination of all the world's populations. The priceless artistic and archaeological treasures on its territory are witness to the greatness of a population that marked one of the most splendid periods of the human epos. Luxor, Menfi, Abu Simbel are just some of the sites that provide us with a powerful echo of this magnificence. More than those, however, this magnificence is portrayed by the Plain of Giza, a place of wonder and mystery where the absolute has taken form. The pyramids rise up in front of us, as majestic as the nobility of the thought that conceived them. There is nothing quite like this site. The purity of these forms and the power of the entire vision make them leap out of the surrounding panorama. Locked into these magnificent works are harmony, intelligence, constructive knowledge, but above all, the love and dedication of a population in search of the highest ideals. Theirs was a love that succeeded in overcoming the most testing challenges brought by this construction. A love in homage to an eternal human aspiration, immortality. Through the shape of the pyramids, this ideal reaches us in its purest form, coded in the mathematical precision of its geometry and its alignments. The successful completion of this work, in homage to such elevated aspirations, equals the constructors to authentic intellectuals. Who were these men? With what tools did they manage to complete a project of such complexity in these technological and environmental conditions? This is a particularly useful experience to relive today, in the middle of an era characterized by divisions, contrasts, and the decadence of values. The pyramids will, however, always be there to show us that once on this earth, there was true harmony and real cooperation between human beings. A harmony and cooperation that produced results able to bear witness to what we would be capable of if only we could bring these values back into our hearts. The Nile, the soul of Egypt. For thousands of years, it has flowed north on the desert plain. Along its banks, a broad band of green extends to allow life to prosper. Until a few decades ago, the surrounding plain had always regularly undergone gigantic flooding that made the land fertile. The Egyptian population sensed the unswerving passing of cycles of time in this periodicity and knew how to use it to their own advantage. Today, we can understand the importance that the flooding could have had by observing the land beyond the cultivable and inhabited green belt. It is a hostile environment that as far as the eye can see is made up of only stones, sand and scorching sun. Even despite these unique environmental conditions, or perhaps even due to these, a culture was born and developed here that generated works that still today defy the millennia. These works were created in a context that had none of the technical structures that today we couldn't do without. There is an evident contrast between the difficulties of the conditions and the ambition of the projects. The result of such a conflict was that a great intelligence developed in order to create the unique technology necessary. This, perhaps because it was a result of such difficult and unique circumstances, has since been lost through the millennia. What remains is the product of this thought, to bear witness to the greatness of a population that without ever giving in to the great difficulties involved, kept faith in its own elevated objectives.
The view of the plain and of the immense monumental complex of the three pyramids has always made even the cleverest and most audacious people challenge themselves to understand the possible construction techniques used. People of different ages and a variety of cultural backgrounds have compared their ideas, even though only within their groups, with the complexity of the problems which the architect, given the task of constructing the pyramids, must have found himself faced with. It is interesting to notice how the complexity of the work and the difficulty of the conditions in which it was accomplished caused particular problems. Even for those who today possess a preparation that is specific to the environment of the actual engineering of these constructions, it is not easy to find a solution. The size and the complexity of the ancient project require, in fact, extremely demanding parameters. The Pyramid of Cheops, for example, has a square base with sides that measure approximately 230 meters for a mass that extends over an area of 52,900 square meters. The height of the Great Pyramid, in itself disconcerting, was originally 147 meters tall. Today it stands approximately 137 meters tall. This, of course, is only one of the three pyramids that we can find on the site of Giza. The second pyramid, in height order, is that of Kefren. This occupies a base of approximately 210 meters and stands a little taller than 136 meters. The third pyramid, known as that of Mycerino, despite being the smallest, also boasts very respectful measurements. It is in fact 65 meters tall, with the sides of the base each 108 meters long. The visible boulders on the first layers represent what remains of the outer covering. Blocks of red granite from Aswan, many of which show the particularity of having the sides cut obliquely. Returning to the Great Pyramid, another amazing element in such a colossal construction is the exactness of the alignments. Its northern face is perfectly orientated according to the true geographic north. The other faces are arranged with the same care as regards the remaining cardinal points. The alignments of the passages that go from the inside towards some stars of the firmament are also surprisingly accurate. These, however, are only a few of the marvels present in this incredible monument. The Great Gallery, the Queen's Room, the Z or Internal Tower, and the room at its base, known as the King's Room, are equally surprising and must be admired for their impressive geometric and mathematical perfection. Until now, various solutions have been put forward, both theoretical and practical, that would explain the mysterious techniques used by the ancient Egyptians to build this magnificent construction. One thing is however certain, although there are many examples of great building works of modern architecture, it would still today be a great problem to produce a work that was just as precise as the Great Pyramid. Diomedi, an Italian originating from Civitanova Marche, has a rich professional past that has led him to face different entrepreneurial types. He has run activities in the sector of small and medium-sized enterprises and later in that of constructions. Having found himself faced with the challenge of the problems related to the construction of the Great Pyramid, he was fascinated and tried, as many others before him, to put himself in the shoes of the person 
who had the task of translating this great project into a practical plan. For this reason, following logic and intuition, he agreed to try to answer this millennial challenge. The vision that has been handed down to us by our superficial mass culture leads us to believe that the pyramids were constructed with the toil and sacrifice of thousands of slaves. This is, however, an idea that really is not historically accurate. In fact, at the time in Egypt, there were no slaves. For this reason, such perfection was accomplished by capable men of great technical ability and who were strongly motivated to reach a concept that Elio Diomedi has kept of utmost importance during his research. He, in fact, imagines a building site in perfect harmony, where the various specialists work together to save time and energy, making the most of ideas rather than brute force and who are strongly motivated to reach the ultimate aim. This motivation also involved the Egyptian women, who actively collaborated in the building of these magnificent structures. The aim of this project was to enhance the figure of the pharaoh in the best possible way, as for them he was the living image of divinity. The human means are, therefore, fundamentally important, and according to Diomedes' hypothesis, a staff of highly qualified and specialised people is required, from those who produce the stones to those who pull them up to the top and finally to those who are responsible for the smoothing and the positioning of them within the work. His project takes into account the times, human means and technical means available. These means would have had to have been extremely functional, created with materials that were easily found and able to adapt to the morphological characteristics of the ground, above all avoiding useless expense of resources and of energy. With all this in mind, this scholar retains just one basic idea that sustains his hypothesis – simplicity. For this reason, the scarcity of means was not an obstacle, but rather it helped the simple ideas of the ancient planners who one day decided that with their work they would defy the millenni. Unfortunately, until now, no direct testimonies have been found to the constructive methods used by the Egyptians for the building of the Pyramid of Cheops. The oldest information comes from Herodotus, who, visiting Egypt in the year 500 BC, brought a brief description of how the construction took place. Then, news comes from Diodorus Siculo, who, approximately 500 years later, partly confirmed what the first historian had reported. They both spoke of sleighs and inclined planes, whilst Herodotus also mentioned another element, writing of the use of, for lack of a better explanation, short woods. He did not, however, indicate their specific shape and use. When the two ancient historians visited the Great Pyramid, it was even more incredible than it is today. In fact, at the time, its outer covering of finely smoothed white limestone was still intact, and this made the pyramid shine like a beacon under the desert sun. That incredible sight made the two visitors, who would certainly have been astounded when faced with this magnificent structure, ask themselves how a similar structure could have been erected, just as many do today. A major earthquake in around 1200 AD caused the outer covering to crumble and fall to the ground. It was therefore collected and used for the construction of numerous buildings and mosques of the city of Cairo, and today we can see the remains of this in only a few segments at the base of the pyramid. Through the years, many scholars have tried to understand how they could best use the elements described in the testimony of the two ancient historians to resolve the construction problems. The sleigh is understandable, and also the inclined planes, but where do the short woods come in? What role did they have? These have been the greatest puzzle for all those who have searched for the solution to the problem, but the interpretations that have been suggested up till now have not shown a useful and rational arrangement in the project environment. During the study of the systems proposed by other scholars, 
Diomedi became interested in two solutions, whilst however not believing either of them to be satisfactorily efficient. The first system proposed the adoption of a sleigh containing the stone block. In order to slide, this would have used a path covered with slippery mud. The solution, if it is possible, would require a large number of workers, because the friction, however slippery the path, is still very high and would need tremendous strength to overcome the inertial state. Furthermore, wet mud would soften the earth, which would then cause the heavily loaded sleigh to sink, making it impossible to continue working. The second method, which stands out in many theories, suggests the use of rollers placed underneath the previously described sleigh, on which the sleighs would move more easily. In this case, the friction is considerably reduced, but other complications of a practical level come in. The wooden rollers would have to be perfectly cylindrical and the earth underneath absolutely level and solid, otherwise the wood would sink inexorably underneath the enormous weights of the boulders. Furthermore, where the rollers were not perfectly aligned, they would inevitably start to cross over each other, causing obvious problems. In fact, the Italian scholar's experience during the moving of industrial machines weighing tens of tons has shown him that rollers, even if made of iron, perfectly cylindrical and placed on a smooth and level floor, slip to the side after only a few steps, making it extremely difficult to continue. These projects have tried to explain how the ancient Egyptians would have been able to build the construction. Elio Diomedi, instead, suggests a project about how they could have accomplished the work of art. He does not, therefore, wish to affirm that his solutions would have been those really used by the ancient builders. As already said, as regards the time required for the completion, the project must agree with the testimonies that are currently known. The Chronicles of Herodotus state that 20 years were required, and according to Diomedes' study, this would be sufficient, as long as the planning takes every minimal detail into account. This imposes a logistic and rigid organisation which starts at the extraction caves and continues through to the coordination of the transport to the positioning of the boulders into the work. By dividing the more than 2 million stone blocks by approximately 7,000 days, which represent 20 years worth of work, we get a result of approximately 350. This is a substantial and demanding number if we remember that this represents the quantity of boulders to be transported and manipulated every day. A demand that becomes even greater if we look more deeply into the internal structure of the Great Pyramid. We can see, in fact, that the tower located in the heart of the pyramid, the tower that the Egyptians call Z, is made up of monoliths of granite of extraordinary proportions. The average weight of these enormous blocks is about 50 tons, and these are found at heights that vary from 40 to 60 meters. The problem of their transport and their positioning within the work is by far the most serious. The King's Room, which measures 10 meters long by 5 wide and 5 high, is at the base of the tower. This is also internally constructed with enormous blocks of red granite, that have been incomparably smoothed and positioned. In order to access this wonderful room, you must go along a spectacular inclined gallery, best known as the Great Gallery, which, despite being constructed using limestone monoliths, shows the same precision and difficulty of construction as the granite tower. For this reason, considering the inadequacy of the two methods previously examined, what system could provide a more rational and efficient way to resolve the problem? The previous solutions, according to Elio Diomedi, are missing a fundamental component, which the historians recorded as the short woods. 
This is an element that, in his opinion, is absolutely fundamental in order to use the sleighs. This, therefore, is his new idea. The short woods are none other than fairly hard wooden sleepers, similar to those used to join the rails of railway tracks. These sleepers, that have been greased with animal fat, greatly help to overcome the inertial point and allow even very heavy means to slide. The greasing of these sleepers is extremely important in order for the sleighs to work well, and as this is not an excessively onerous task, it is also work that can be carried out by women. The above mentioned sleepers are arranged transversely, underneath the sleigh, at distances of about one meter from each other, and form a path that adapts well to any type of terrain, without having to use sophisticated preventative plans. It is important to state that the sleepers would have to form a path that covers entirely and permanently all the paths via land taken by the boulders up until their arrival at the pyramid. The sleigh, the inclined plane and the short woods are the natural means that many scholars have had available in order to resolve the puzzle without having ever succeeded in finding the right combination. The use of animal fat as a lubricant was another of the Italian scholar's simple but fundamental ideas. This has been shown to be, by a long way, the most efficient amongst all the hypotheses revealed up until now. Also, in fact, in this context, animal fat has been more successful than more modern lubricants. With this particular combination of elements, it is possible to transport the heavy stone boulders without using thousands of men and without inventing odd or bizarre solutions that do not fit well into the historic, social and environmental context. As regards the presence of sleighs similar to those planned by Elio Diomedi in ancient Egypt, there is a find exhibited in the Museum of Cairo. Whilst as regards their use for the transport of large weights, there is some reference in the ancient hieroglyphics. In order to test the efficiency of his idea, the scholar carried out his first tests using models and weights on a significantly reduced scale. Having obtained a more than satisfying result, he then carried out further tests with decidedly more consistent elements. At the beginning, these tests were done in Italy. And having seen that they confirmed the efficiency of the solution, even with a mass weight of more than two tons, he decided to repeat the experiment directly in its original context, on the plain of Giza. It is important to stress that for a while now, Elio Diomedi had already been informing the Egyptian archaeological authorities of his theories, creating major interest. This interest then grew with the continuous exchanges of information and updates that they brought to the various meetings with respective delegations both in Italy and in Egypt. These had also involved technology that supported the Italian scholars' theory. Furthermore, right from the first meetings they instinctively liked each other and a great friendship grew up between Diomedi and the chief superintendent of the plain of Giza, Professor Zahi Hawaz. It was thanks to his particular interest that in January 2000 an important event took place in the singular adventure of the resolute Italian researcher. A boulder weighing approximately one and a half tons was gradually pulled along the hard ground of the plain by 12 people. Okay. 
once positioned on the sleigh on the suitably greased sleepers, it became easy for even only two men to move the heavy block of calcareous stone. For the transport system uh, that was so fundamental to the, to the construction of the pyramid, I was inspired by Herodotus. He visited Egypt 500 years before Christ and, and brought some information about the construction of the pyramid. He stated that sleighs, inclined planes and short woods were needed to construct the pyramid. Secondo la mia ipotesi, i legni corti non sarebbe altro. I believe that these short woods were simply sleepers placed transversely underneath the sleigh in order to reduce friction with the earth. Queste traversine venivano opportunamente ingrassate sulla The surfaces of these sleepers would have been greased in order to ease the movement. This is a very intelligent idea and I think that uh... I don't know personally if the pharaohs used it or not, but it seems that this could be the most logic idea that two people move uh, about two tons of stone. And, uh, and this is really, it's an amazing. And I think Diomede is a very smart person uh, because we thought before that the Egyptian used only uh, sledges, two sledges, but we don't know if they divided it by this way, then the stone can be smoothed easy but it could be happened by the ancient Egyptian. Observing both the limestone blocks used for the construction of the exterior covering of the pyramid and the great gallery, and the large granite monoliths used for the construction of the Z and of the king's room, we can see that all the visible and touchable faces are perfectly squared and smooth. The aim was surely to obtain a strong adherence between the two surfaces and therefore to give an exceptional stability to the structure, even without special cement. As you can see, the sarcophagus and these enormous boulders have been taken from the caves of Aswan, which are approximately 1,000 kilometers to the south of Cairo. You should notice that they are perfectly formed. It is incredible how they have prepared these enormous stones with such precision at the time in which they were made. Surely, also on this occasion, the key word is simplicity. The basic idea is to get the blocks being worked on to rub against other smaller stone blocks with abrasive quartziferous stone and lime in the middle. A robust wooden framework of the same size as the surface of the stone to be worked on is required for this operation. Inside the perimeter of the framework, smaller stones of the same type as the block to be smoothed were inserted and therefore, with the lime and the sand between the surfaces in contact, we can imagine a repeated backward and forward movement. Even if such a method was extremely tiring and required very many workers, it is also exceedingly efficient and allows you to obtain the results that the planners had established. These operations would have been carried out directly in the cave, so that the boulders, once sent on their journey, would arrive directly at the place where they were to be positioned in the work, without further interruptions, in this way optimising the supply of building material. As we have seen, the more sophisticated and colossal interior parts of the Great Pyramid, namely Zed and the King's Room, are built using large blocks of red granite. The cave from which these enormous boulders were extracted is located in Aswan, which is located approximately 1,000 kilometers south of the plain of Giza. Uh, all of this came from Aswan. You know, it's huge, uh, uh, 16 tons of granite. And the ancient Egyptian we know from 
sources in the new kingdom that they moved all this from the quarry in Aswan through the Nile and they brought it to a harbor. We discovered the harbor of Cube's pyramid in front of the Valley Temple and how they dragged the stone to here. This room is completely uh, the most perfect and silent place in the world. The cave of the blocks of limestone was, instead, located at about 30 kilometers from the site of the pyramid, in a place called Tura, still within the area of the banks of the Nile, to the south of Giza. It is therefore also necessary to find a good method of transporting the boulders and the extremely heavy monoliths. Naturally, given the nearness of the River Nile to the two sites of the Caves of Extraction, this represented both the most practical and the fastest way to transport the blocks. In fact, this large waterway, apart from being a life source and sustenance for the population, thanks to its navigability, was very adaptable to this use. But, just as it seems obvious to think that the use of the river would have been the most natural thing, it is not so obvious to understand how to load the said blocks onto the boats. In fact, just the thought of loading the monoliths and the boulders with a boat into the water is impossible, in that the barge would immediately overturn due to the excessive weight. Therefore, also in this case, we need to use a special technique. The stone blocks would have been positioned onto the sleighs directly in the cave, and brought to the riverbank thanks to a path constructed with sleepers identical to those used on the ramps of the pyramids. Once arrived, the blocks would then be placed together with the sleigh using a special U-shaped loading docks above the chosen barges, previously drawn to the ground and equipped with sleepers. Each loading dock would have had to contain the barge very precisely in order to hold it and to avoid dangerous skidding during the loading. Following this, only after the perfect positioning of the sleigh with its mass, could they proceed to the launching of the boat. Upon arrival of the means, using the same type of loading dock as at the departure, and the same system of sleepers, they could have unloaded the blocks without too much difficulty. At this point, having verified that his transport system was valid, the problem becomes how to erect such a large construction. In order to understand what could have been a possible system, taking into account the parameters of the project, we should start by considering that the terrain on which the pyramids are based is a large stone block that makes for a solid base to support the immense weight of the monument. The first phase of the project is the levelling of the relevant area and following this the creation of the entire perimeter using squared and smooth stones that have already had their final exterior covering completed. Only in this way in fact is it possible to obtain perfect alignment and maintain the correct angles. The internal area of the perimeter should therefore be filled with the sandstone that represents the central nucleus of the construction. The following layers are carried out with exactly the same method. First you build the external perimeter with the covering stones, already definitively smoothed and angled, and then you fill the internal area with the sandstone. This procedure allows you to constantly check the phases of construction, and also saves many years of work. If it were otherwise, the exterior covering would have to be completed only once the pyramid has been finished. The overhanging platforms that were planned by Elio Diomedi are a practical solution in order to be able to check the covering blocks accurately from the outside. Obviously, the system of sleighs and sleepers would also be used for the movements above the various floors and the final positioning of the boulders into the work. But how is it possible to go up from level to level without having to build enormous ramps or scaffolding?
Amongst the most common ideas on how it could have been possible to build the Great Pyramid, we have the use, as an operative base, of ramps of trodden sand, joined as an ascending spiral to the walls of the monument or placed longitudinally on one side. But even with a basic analysis, such a theory is shown to be impossible. The enormous dimensions of the construction would require quantities of sand that would multiply the workload ridiculously. The pyramid, in fact, is a true and real stone mountain. Approximately 2,500,000 blocks are necessary for the entire work, the weight of which is estimated at about 6 million tonnes. From this, it follows that the method of the exterior ramps, to first erect them and then dismantle them, they would have needed to move a volume of material more than at least five times that of the monument, and equal to tens of millions of tons. With this test, I wanted to demonstrate the enormous quantity of material that would have been used to construct a ramp of 1,450 metres, as you can see here in this model. In order to get to 600 metres, I've had to use material equal to the volume of five pyramids. For this reason, at this point, I believe that I'm justified in interrupting the experiment, as this method would have been impossible. Only an efficient and rational method of transport could therefore, avoid useless wastes of time and energy. Here is the solution also to the problem. During the building of the first levels, the stone blocks travel up on an exterior ramp that growing alongside the work is placed sideways on next to one of the sides of the structure for the whole of its length up to the height of 15 meters. In this way, the reasonable gradient of 6% allows the stones to be pulled up without great effort. Having arrived at a height of approximately 15 metres, and at the end of one side of the construction, the following ramp is formed directly inside the pyramid. At a 90 degree angle with respect to the first, it runs along the other side of the construction, but not outside the perimeter. This ramp lies inside by a few metres, so that the exterior work can be done along this side. At the end of this ramp, at a height of approximately 25 metres, a vast area is dug out in order to allow for the people who are pulling the sleighs to manoeuvre easily. The third and fourth ramps should be configured in the same way as the second, reaching the considerable height of 40 metres. The main aim of this phase is that of having ramps suitable to allowing blocks weighing several tonnes be pulled up and that would then afterwards be covered and surmounted by the blocks and by the exterior covering, becoming in this way galleries suitable for the transport of the smaller stones. The ramps, therefore, are not closed to form galleries until all the formidable granite monoliths necessary for the building of the Z have been taken up the structure. Along the way, they would have carefully left slits created to provide illumination and ventilation for the galleries themselves. At the same rate, with the same technique and forming a type of spiral, you continue with the other inclined floors that then become galleries until reaching the top of the monument. As a whole, we can imagine these inclined galleries as a type of large spiral staircase which turns along the internal perimeter of the construction itself. The sleepers, or short woods, are placed permanently along these ramps and stay there until the work has been completed. The building of the passages, the galleries, the interior rooms and the Z-Tower took place metre by metre going up each floor of the construction, so as to avoid useless and untenable framework.
As regards the point of the pyramid, a solution is necessary that makes it fairly easy to place the final part of the monument into the work. In fact, once almost at the summit, there is so little space left to manoeuvre that the ramps and the galleries would be of no more use and it would be no longer be possible to build exterior platforms. In order to solve this problem, Diomedi suggests the preventative measure of a wooden framework that rises slightly higher than the top of the pyramid. This structure is formed by a chest with an internal column that holds the platform supporting the pyramid's point in the place in which the point will be positioned. The chest is filled with sand so that it will hold and leave space above to manoeuvre in order to position the last layers of the stone. Once at the right quota, the sand is made to go out of the bottom part of its container and the point lowers to rest it on its definitive seat. We should remember that according to the ancient chronicles, the point of the Great Pyramid was covered in gold. Once it is in place, they would have retraced their steps, closing the galleries and the slits with suitable blocks. In this way, no trace remains of the construction method used. We discovered in our excavations at the pyramids uh, evidence about uh, the location of the quarries, where the Egyptians uh, brought the stones. And also we found out how they established uh, the ramp, the ramp that they moved the stones on this ramp. The only thing that we did not really have evidence about is moving the stones, how the Egyptian actually moved the stones. Looking at Elio Domini, uh, uh, theory of how he actually, how the ancient Egyptian moved the stones, I can see it's very interesting. It's convincing more than any other theories that I saw uh, in many, uh, with many other people. And I think Elio Dumede did a good job. And I believe, uh, I always say, if I believe in the incarnation, I should believe that Elio Dumede was the architect who designed the Great Pyramid. And, uh, and therefore, I think that the people in uh, Shevetta Nova has to be very uh, happy and proud that they have someone like Elio Dumedi uh, is from Shevetta Nova. After having made this journey, which has indicated a possible solution to the problems that were to be found by the builders of the Great Pyramid, we can do nothing more than admire the completeness of the simple but logical solutions suggested by Elio Dumedi. Such techniques are the result of a passionate work that makes no claims, but that merely wishes to suggest a new, uncomplicated, possible strategy for the completion of the construction of the Pyramid of Cheops. Slays, short woods, barges and all the solutions presented by the scholar have been shown to work. Their functionality makes it possible to complete the project within the time span reported by the historians and with the instruments that are perfectly in keeping with the period to be considered. Using a little of his own experience, and a little by putting himself in the shoes of the ancient architect, Diomedi has tried to solve the puzzle of the construction of this millennial structure, with a solution that gives justice to Egypt and to the genius of the Egyptians. This beautiful and imposing structure bears witness to what summits man can achieve if guided by faith and intellect. The sun, 
the sky and the natural surroundings of the Great Plain of Giza were witness to this unique and unrepeatable event. The Nile, Egypt's beating heart, sustained life then as today. Along its banks, many daily actions have remained unchanged through time. Unchanged as are, in their majesty, the mute guardians of a mystery that shows the world technical ability, expertise, and grandiosity of thought of a civilization projected ahead of its time. A civilization that knew how to excel for the majesty of its achievements that have proudly challenged the millennia. A concept that is eloquently expressed by an old Arabian saying, man is afraid of time, time is afraid of the pyramids. Thank you.